you started and did a little bit of a whirlwind overview of how you get the 35,000x uh, speed up or more over Python. Um, Jeremy Howard did a really great presentation about yeah. sort of the basic, like looking at the code, here's how you get the speed up. Like you said, that's something we could, uh, probably developers can do for, for their own code to see how you can get these yeah. gigantic speed ups. But can you maybe speak to the machine learning task in general? How do you, how do you make some of this code fast and specific? It's like, what would you say is the main bottleneck uh, for uh, machine learning tasks? So are we talking yeah. about uh, MatMall matrix multiplication? How do you make that fast? So, I mean, if you just look at the Python problem, right? You can say, how do I make Python faster? And there's been a lot of people that have been working on the Okay, how do I make Python 2x faster, 10x faster, or something like that, right? And there have been a ton of projects in that vein, right? Mojo started from the, what can the hardware do? Like, what is the limit of physics? Yeah. What is the speed of light? <laughs> what is yeah. the, yeah. like, how fast can this thing go? And then how do I express that? Yeah. Right, and so it wasn't, rel it wasn't anchored relatively on make Python a little bit faster. It's saying, cool, I know what the hardware can do. Let's unlock that, right? Now, when you... <laughs> when, <laughs> you just say how how gutsy that is to be in the meeting and as opposed to trying to see how do we get the improvement? It's like, what can the physics do? I mean, maybe I'm a special kind of nerd, but you look at that, what is the limit of physics? How fast can these things go, right? When you start looking at that, typically it ends up being a memory problem, mm -hmm. right? And so today, uh, particularly with these specialized accelerators, the problem is that you can do a lot of math within them, but you, you get bottleneck sending data back and forth to memory, whether it be local memory or distant memory or disk or whatever it is. And, and that, that bottleneck particularly as the training sizes get large, as you start doing tons of inferences all, all, all over the place, like th that becomes a huge bottleneck for people, right? So again, what happened is we went through a phase of many years where people took the special case and hand tuned it and tweaked it and tricked it out and they knew exactly how the hardware worked and they knew the model and they made it, they made it fast didn't generalize. <laughs> and so you can make, you know, ResNet 50 or some, or AlexNet or something, Inception V1, like you can, you can do that, right? Because the models are small, they fit in your head, right? But as the models get bigger, more complicated, as the machines get more complicated, it stops working, right? And so this is where things like kernel fusion come in. So what is kernel fusion? This is this idea of saying, let's avoid going to memory. And let's do that by building a new hybrid kernel and a numerical algorithm that actually keeps things in the accelerator instead of having to write all the way out to memory. Mm -hmm. right? What's happened with, with these accelerators now is you get multiple levels of memory. Like in a GPU, for example, you'll have global memory and local memory and like all, all these things. Um, if you zoom way into how hardware works, the register file is actually a memory. <laughs> so the registers are like an L0 cache. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of taking advantage of the hardware ends up being fully utilizing the full power in all of its capability. And this has a number of problems, right? One of which is, again, the complexity disaster, right? There's too much hardware. Even if you just say, let's look at the chips from one line of vendor, like Apple or Intel or whatever it is, each version of the chip comes out with new features. And they change things so that it takes more time or less time to do different things. And you can't rewrite all the software whenever a new chip comes out, right? And so this is where you need a much more scalable approach. And this is what Mojo and what the modular stack provides, is it provides this infrastructure and the system for factoring all this complexity and then allowing people to express algorithms. You talk about auto-tuning, for example, express algorithms in a more portable way so that when a new chip comes out, you, have to, you don't have to rewrite, rewrite it all. Mm -hmm. So to me, like, you know, I, I kind of joke, like, what is a compiler? Well, there's many ways to explain that. You convert thing A into thing B, and you convert source code to machine code. Like, you, you can talk about many, many things that compilers do. But to me, it's about a bag of tricks. It's about a system and a framework that you can hang complexity. It's a system that can then generalize, and it can work on problems that are bigger than fit in one human's head, <laughs> right? And so what that means, what a good stack and what the mod modular stack provides is the ability to walk up to it with a new problem and it'll generally work quite well. And that's something that a lot of machine learning infrastructure and tools and technologies don't have. Um, typical state of the art today is you walk up, particularly if you're deploying, if you walk up with a new model, you try to push it through the converter and the converter crashes. Mm -hmm. 
that's crazy. The state of ML tooling today is not anything that a C programmer would ever accept, right? And it's always been this kind of flaky set of tooling that's never been integrated well, and it's been uh, never worked together and to, because it's not designed together. It's built by different teams. It's built by different hardware vendors. It's built by different systems. It's built by different internet companies that are trying to solve their, their problems, right? And so that means that we get this fragmented, terrible mess of complexity. So, I mean, the specifics of, I mean, Jeremy showed this. Yeah. Uh, there's the vectorize function, which I guess is uh, built in to the, uh, into Mojo. Uh, vector, vectorize, as he showed, is built into the library. Into the library, instead of the library. Yeah. Um, vectorize, parallelize, yep. which vectorize is more low level, parallelize is higher level. There's the tiling thing, which is how he demonstrated the um, auto tune, I think. So, so think of, think about this in like levels, hierarchical levels of abstraction, mm -hmm. right? And so, at, at the very, if you zoom all the way into a compute problem, you have one floating point number. Mm -hmm. Right, and so then you say, okay, I want to be, I can do things one at a time in an interpreter. <laughs> it's pretty slow, right? So I can get to doing one one at a time in a compiler, like in C. Then I can get to doing four or eight or sixteen at a time with vectors. That's called vectorization. Then you can say, hey, I have a whole bunch of different, you know, what what a multi-core computer is is it's basically a bunch of computers, right? So they're all independent computers that, that can talk to each other and they share memory. And so now what Parallelize does, it says, okay, run multiple instances of this on different computers. And now they can all work together on a problem, right? And so what you're doing is you're saying, keep going out to the next level out. And, and as you do that, how do I take advantage of this? So tiling is a memory optimization, right? It says, okay, let's make sure that we're keeping the data close to the compute part of the problem instead of sending it all back and forth through memory every, every time I, I load a block. And the size of the block size is, is all, that's how you get to the auto-tune to make sure right. it's optimized. Yeah, well, so all of these, the details matter so much to get good performance. Um, this is another funny thing about um, machine learning and high-performance computing that is very different than C compilers we all grew up, grew up with, where, you know, if you get a new version of GCC or a new version of Clang or something like that, you know, maybe something will go 1% faster, right? And so... Compiler engineers will work really, really, really hard to get half a percent out of your C code, something like that. But when you're talking about an accelerator or an AI application, or you're talking about these kinds of algorithms, you know, these are things people used to write in Fortran, for example, right? If you get it wrong, it's not 5% or 1%. It could be 2x or 10x, <laughs> right? If you think about it, um, you really want to make use of the full memory you have, the cache, for example. But if you use too much space, Base, it doesn't fit in the cache, now you're going to be thrashing all the way back out to main memory. And these can be 2x, 10x major performance differences. And so this is where getting these magic numbers and these things right is really actually quite important. 